again to the Downing Street Daily Coronavirus Briefing. I'm joined by Professor John Newton, who coordinates our work on testing, and by Professor Steve Powis, who's the medical director of the NHS. Every day, we're working through our plan to protect life and protect the NHS. By slowing the spread and building the capacity, so at all times, the NHS has got the capacity to give the very best care to everybody who needs it. In today's briefing, after setting out the daily statistics, I want to talk about testing. But beforehand, I'd like to share some really good news. Earlier this week, I said that we are now able to begin the restoration of NHS services. Now that we're past the peak, I can tell you about the next step, the restoration of fertility services. Few families have been untouched by the amazing advances in fertility treatments over the past generation. And I know just how time sensitive fertility treatment can be and how important it is for the families affected. And I know that this treatment can change lives for the better forever. So when I say thank you to all of you, everybody watching, for staying at home to protect the NHS, of course I'm saying thank you on behalf of the lives that you're saving. But I'm also saying thanks on behalf of the lives that the NHS can now once again help to create. Because together, we've protected the NHS. And we're now restoring the NHS and restoring the chance for so many couples to start a family. Turning to the figures, 177,454 people have tested positive for coronavirus, an increase of 6,201 since yesterday. 15,111 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus, and 27,510 people have now sadly died across all settings, an increase of 739. As one, we'll remember them and treasure their memories. This is a virus that has a devastating impact on families, on friends, on local communities. And right across government, we're working day and night to defeat it. At the beginning of last month, at this podium, I set a goal that anyone who needs a test should get a test. And that, as a nation, we should achieve 100,000 tests per day by the end of the month. I knew that it was an audacious goal, but we needed an audacious goal. Because testing is so important for getting Britain back on our feet. I can announce that we have met our goal. The number of tests yesterday, on the last day of April, was 122,000. 347. This unprecedented expansion in British testing capability is an incredible achievement, but it is not my achievement. It is a national achievement, achieved by a huge team of people working together. And I tell you this, the testing capacity that we've built together will help every single person in this country. Testing is crucial to suppress the virus. I know from personal experience, too, just how much people with symptoms want to know if they've got the disease. I know that I did. It helps remove the worry. It helps keep people safe. And it will help us to unlock the lockdown. So many people have tragically died. And the challenge that we still face is vast but we're making real progress. I want to take a moment to thank and pay tribute to the incredible team who did this together and who joined in one of the greatest national mobilizations that we've seen. We brought together the best civil servants, the best minds from the private sector, the best scientists, the best lab technicians, and the best of the best in the armed forces. Setting stretching, ambitious goals in a crisis has a galvanizing effect on everybody involved. It is a mission. 
If we hadn't been so bold, if we'd chosen a safer, easier path, I just can't see how we would have built the capacity that we need. In a few short weeks, we've created a new test for the virus in PHE. We've built a network of regional testing centers. We've put a fleet of mobile testing units on the road and created home testing kits. So if you can't get to the test, we can get the test to you. We've more than doubled the capacity of NHS and Public Health England labs and created three brand new mega labs to analyze the results. So many people have played a part in this work. British diagnostic companies like Randox and Oxford Nanopore and Medical Wire and DNA Nudge and Samba. Logistic companies like the Royal Mail and Yodel, who were brilliant and got us out of a real hole this week. Academics like Professor Derek Crook and Sir John Bell from Oxford and Professor Aradazai from Imperial. Deloitte and Boots, who've delivered our drive through centres. AstraZeneca, GSK, uh, Novasite, whose labs go on stream next week. Public Health England and the NHS, of course, who've pulled out all the stops. Professor Sharon Peacock, Professor John Newton, and the UK Biocentre and the Crick, who set up high-tech laboratories. And also, it wasn't just a national effort. People from across the world, including Thermo Fisher, Hologic, Abbott, and Amazon from the US, Kyogen from Germany, and Roche from Switzerland. And this is how we did it, because everybody worked together with grit and determination to reach a shared goal. And they thrived because the team contained diversity of perspectives, of backgrounds, and critically, a diversity of thought. And when things went wrong, which they did every single day, believe me, we didn't ask who we could blame. We asked how we could fix it. So to my team, I want to say you toiled tirelessly, night and day, and I'm so proud of what you have achieved. And to all of you, on behalf of government, on behalf of the whole country, thank you. As the Prime Minister said, a big increase in testing provides a way to unlock the puzzle of coronavirus. And testing forms the first element of our plan to test, track and trace. By mid-May, we'll have an initial 18,000 contact tracers in place. That work is underway as we speak, and if it needs to be bigger, we'll scale it as required. The combination of contact tracers and new technology through our new COVID-19 NHS app will help tell us where the virus is spreading and help everyone to control new infections. People will be able to know if they've been in close contact with someone who's transmitting the disease and take the action that they need to. Our full-scale test, track and trace model will drive the infection rate down and the lower the R and the lower of number of new infections, the more effective the track and trace system will be. Tracking and tracing will allow us to get R down and hold R down. And so it will allow us to lift lockdown measures. Now, this disease affects us all indiscriminately. We've seen that. In recent weeks, we've had to impinge on historic liberties to protect our NHS and our loved ones. And yet our goal must be freedom. Freedom from the virus, yes, and we will not lift measures until it is safe to do so. But also, we care about the restoration of social freedom and economic freedom too. Each citizen's right to do as they please. For now, we're working together to stay home. We're impinging on the freedom of all for the safety of all. With this next mission of test, track and trace, I'm seeking a solution that allows us, by each of us participating, to target the measures that are needed with much more precision. And so to reassert, as much as is safely possible, the liberty of us all. That is our next mission. But for now, the most important thing for everyone to do to keep R down and to get us all through this is to maintain the spirit and the resolve that's had such an impact thus far. So please, stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. And now Professor Newton is going to set out some more details 
of, on, on testing. And then I'm going to ask uh, Professor Powis uh, to set out and take us through the slides. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, and can I also thank you on behalf of the programme for those kind words of thanks. It's been a truly extraordinary collaboration, but thank you very much. Um, we have reached an important milestone, but I want to explain why we need all this testing. Back in March, the country moved into lockdown because the virus was circulating widely, not because we did not have enough tests. Cases were popping up with no obvious connection to other cases, and the infection was entering the exponential growth phase. And at that point, access to limitless testing, even if we had had it, would have made no difference. The decision to enter lockdown would have been the same and would have been taken at the same time. In the same way, the route out of lockdown has not been blocked by low levels of testing. We can relax social distancing only when the government's five tests are met, and that means particularly getting the infection rate right down. Testing will, as Secretary of State has mentioned, help to keep it under control once we're out of lockdown. But our levels of testing have not kept us in lockdown a day longer. What about Germany? People talk about Germany a lot. But yes, Germany had a lot of tests available from the get-go. But there was also a lot less virus around in Germany when they introduced social distancing, and it was circulating in younger people. So as uh, CMO pointed out in an earlier briefing, we should not rush to draw conclusions about relationships between numbers of tests available and outcomes in different countries. Nevertheless, as CMO also said, we, we are learning from other countries, uh, and we have learned from the experience of other countries. But back to the here and now, where does all this leave us in the UK? Well, the 100,000 tests a day target was set for two purposes. As Secretary of State has mentioned, it was intended to motivate the programme and set the scale of our ambition, and it has certainly done that. More importantly, though, perhaps, we knew from our calculations that we would need something like this level of testing to be ready for the next phase of the response to the pandemic. Looking to the future, then, we now have a very substantial and flexible testing capability in the UK. It will be used to drive extensive contact tracing to control any new infections, to help us keep patients and staff safe in hospitals and care services, and to tell us with some precision how the virus has spread across the country and is spreading in the future. If we can quickly identify who may have been in contact with someone infected, we can prevent them from passing it on and so drive down transmission rates of the virus. Now, the new NHS app for contact tracing is also in development and making rapid progress. And the more people who sign up for the new app when it goes live, the better informed our responses will be and the more effective we will be in keeping the virus under control. All this progress with testing and with our, our design of the, uh, the next phase of contact tracing and the app frees ministers and their scientific advisors to choose whatever future strategies are best suited to keep the country safe. I can assure you that the testing capability we have built in the last few weeks is world-leading in its scale and sophistication and gives us the flexibility we need. As the pandemic evolves, we will have the testing capacity to meet changing demand across the country. It is now there to serve us all. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, John. And um, Professor Pass, if you'll take us through the slides. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, and good afternoon, everybody. So as I and others have said on many occasions, the magnificent response of the British public to the government's request uh, to comply with social distancing instructions has meant that we have begun to get on top of this virus. We've seen the transmission rate, the re reproduction rate fall to below one, and that means uh, that the number of new infections is falling uh, within our communities. And that has meant that pressure has been kept off the NHS. The NHS has responded magnificently to make sure that uh, patients have always uh, had available the treatment they require. Uh, and uh, over time, this will also has an impact on the unfortunate number of deaths that we've seen. Uh, and as we move to the next phase of managing uh, COVID-19, I think the first thing I'd like to do is to remind everybody of the five tests that the government has set uh, uh, for adjusting uh, the current lockdown. Uh, the first I've already uh, referred to, and that's that the NHS continues to have sufficient capacity to provide the critical care uh, uh, requirements that are needed, uh, but also specialist treatment right across uh, the UK. 
Secondly, uh, it's that sustained and consistent fall in daily deaths uh, from coronavirus, and we are beginning to see that, but we uh, need to make sure that that is maintained. Thirdly, it's reliable data to show that the rate of infection is decreasing to manageable levels across the board. Uh, and again, as I've said, it's everybody's efforts in complying with social distancing that means that infections have fallen and will continue to fall. Fourthly, uh, this has been a challenge, uh, not just in the UK, but globally, around the operational response uh, to a pandemic. Uh, that includes PPE, it includes other things. Uh, and moving forward, we need to ensure that those challenges, testing is one of them, uh, are in hand and that we are in a good position going forward uh, to meet future de demand. Uh, and finally, and, and, and critically, uh, that any adjustments going forward uh, don't risk a second wave, a second peak of infections that again runs a risk uh, of overwhelming our health systems. So those are the five key tests that have been set uh, and the government will be looking to be confident uh, that it has met those before it moves uh, to the next uh, phase uh, of uh, the lockdown and the measures that we will need to take uh, going forward uh, to uh, stay on top of this virus and ensure infection rates uh, remain low. Now in the next slide, um, we will provide, I'm providing some details of exactly how, how the British public have complied. Uh, and the first is uh, uh, an example uh, on uh, how people have been approaching contact, uh, particularly with vulnerable people over a period uh, in the middle part of April, showing that 84%, uh, the, the great majority of adults have said they'd either not left their home or only left their home for permitted reasons. Uh, and 87% of adults avoiding contact with older or vulnerable uh, people. So again, great testament to uh, the efforts that the British uh, public have gone to uh, to ensure that we reduce infections. And then on the right of this slide, uh, some information on the number of people who've been working at home since social distancing measures were introduced. Uh, and that's 45% of adults in employment uh, saying that they work at home. Uh, and that compares to around 12% uh, uh, of last year. So again, a great increase in those that are not going out, that are staying at home and are managing uh, to work uh, without having uh, to go in their, their usual place uh, of work. Um, and on the third slide, uh, um, we uh, begin to see uh, the testing information the Secretary of State uh, said, as, as both Secretary of State and John have said, the number of tests uh, have increased dramatically. Uh, but it's not just the fact the numbers have increased, it's the fact that capacity has increased so that we can use testing uh, for a far, far a wider range of purposes. And you have already heard uh, some of the areas in which that is going to be critical going forward uh, in the months ahead. Uh, in the fourth slide, uh, we um, show the new cases as determined by positive tests. Uh, you will see that that has increased uh, a bit in recent days, but that should be seen in the context that we have increased the number of tests uh, in the round. So more testing uh, and more testing of different groups of individuals uh, is likely uh, to bring more positive uh, tests as a result. Uh, but overall, I think uh, the number is relatively stable and that is a good sign uh, and reflects that the level of infection is falling. In the next slide, uh, we then move uh, to uh, people who unfortunately, and again, it's a mild illness for the great majority of people, but for a proportion who do have to be admitted to hospital, you can see uh, that since the middle of April, uh, numbers of people in hospital with COVID-19 have been falling. And that's particularly marked in London, uh, that um, was ahead in terms of the infection rate, uh, and though, therefore that fall has come quickest in London. Uh, it is starting uh, to move down, maybe at a slower level in other regions uh, of, uh, uh, of the UK, but nevertheless, overall the trend uh, is, is downwards. And then that also translates uh, in the next slide to uh, people who, again, small minority but important group that uh, have to be treated in our critical care facilities. This shows the proportion of people with COVID-19 in critical care beds. And again, that is falling uh, in the four nations. And the absolute number of people in critical care beds, so not just the percentage, but the absolute number is also uh, declining. And then finally, we move, unfortunately, to deaths, the sad deaths that have occurred. Uh, and again, uh, we're now talking, uh, we're now showing deaths in all settings. Uh, we were previously, up until a few days ago, showing deaths in hospital settings. We've now expanded this. 
Uh, and again, you see those numbers do vary from day to day, and there's a, uh, a reporting lag at the weekend. Uh, but overall, the seven-day rolling average, uh, which smooths out those daily, uh, that daily variation, is showing that the number of deaths is beginning to trend uh, downwards. And then very finally, we show the usual international comparison uh, against other uh, countries. Uh, and again, this comes uh, with the usual caveat uh, that this sort of comparison is really important. It's now UK all settings, uh, but uh, the real comparison is in uh, all cause mortality. Uh, so in excess deaths uh, in countries, uh, that is measured more um, uh, more consistently between uh, countries, but there will be some time before that analysis uh, can be done. So although it's important to show this data, I think it's important to remember uh, that it will be a number of months uh, and perhaps longer uh, before we can see the true comparison uh, between uh, countries. Uh, so finally, uh, to remind people that um, the hardships we've been going through, the compliance with social distancing is working, uh, the key thing is it needs to continue to work, so we all must continue uh, to not think that this is over. This is really the beginning, uh, but it is translating into benefits in pressure on the NHS uh, and on reduction in deaths, so it's important that we all keep it up. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. So the first question is going to be from Andrew from uh, Leeds, uh, who joins us by video. Hello. My question is, when lockdown restrictions are lifted and schools open, will there be fines if people choose to keep their children off school, even if it's open for their age group? And also, how will you make sure the public is confident it's safe? Well, uh, thanks, Andrew. That's a, a, a really important question. Um, the, um, our, our aim is that when it is safe to do so, uh, then we'll make recommendations of changes like this. Um, but we will only do it when it's safe to do so. So it, it, we are not going to reopen schools if it isn't uh, safe. Now, of course, the, this disease, um, thankfully, uh, doesn't appear to give children uh, symptoms uh, nearly as bad as, uh, as adults. So it is much, much, much safer for children. And maybe, um, Professor Powers, you can add something on that. Um, but we will not reopen until it's safe to do so. So that's on your second question. On the first question, of course, you know, as and when we reopen schools, our goal is to get back to the, the norm and the, and the position as it was uh, before. Uh, and I'm pretty uh, I'm confident that because we'll only do it when it's, when it's safe, uh, then it will at that point then be uh, entirely reasonable and uh, and become normal again to send your children to school. Yes, so, so I think, as Secretary Dave said, it's, it's perfectly correct that, uh, that um, this virus affects children uh, much less than it does uh, the elderly and, and older adults, uh, so they are much uh, less affected by uh, the effects of, of, of having COVID-19. Uh, there have, as we said the last time we were here, there have been some very rare reports about complications in children. We are continuing to look for that. Uh, and try and understand uh, if there is any link. Uh, but the overall message is for children, uh, this is a mild disease uh, or is, is one that produces very little symptoms. Uh, the science is still um, evolving in terms of transmission between children, so we do need to be cautious as we think about opening schools, and we will need to think carefully and advise the government's uh, uh, appropriate advice as to how, how that might happen. Uh, but the key thing is that this is not... Uh, uh, a serious disease for the vast, vast, vast majority of children uh, and indeed uh, younger people. In fact, it's, it's important to remember, isn't it, that the reason that we had to take the decision to close schools was because of the impact of uh, schools on transmission, yes. not on the safety exactly. of children. Exactly. Uh, and that's important to bear in mind and I hope, uh, I hope reassuring, Andrew. Um, the next question is from Stuart from uh, Redditch and Stuart asks... Given the large investment that's gone into creating the Nightingale hospitals, will we make use of them going forward to help reduce NHS waiting lists at the right time as we come through the pandemic? Um, the answer to your question, Stuart, is that we will do what we need to do to reduce NHS uh, waiting lists as we reopen the NHS. But the Nightingales were designed very specifically uh, for patients who are, uh, who are intubated and therefore who are under 
uh, anesthetic. Uh, so they are specifically designed for uh, COVID. But Steve, you were you you yeah. were behind that project, so. Uh, maybe you can set out more yes, detail. Yes, so, so Secretary of State is quite right. The Nightingale hospitals have been designed with specific purposes in mind. Uh, the ex, the uh, Nightingale Centre in East London uh, created in order to uh, uh, be used if uh, we needed extra capacity for ventilated uh, patients. Fortunately, we have used uh, the Nightingale in London, but fortunately we have managed that surge because of the, uh, the compliance that the British public has shown to social distancing. Uh, so the NHS has done a great job. Uh, but those, those hospitals are designed in a particular way for a particular purpose, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they, uh, they would be fit for purpose for other uh, type of NHS activity. Now, now, of course, we also need to keep them as an insurance policy in the, in the next month or, or, or two, uh, because we need to be confident, as I said in the five tests, that we, that we have a sustained reduction in hospital admissions. Um, but of course, we will always keep things uh, under review uh, going forward. Uh, but I think the key thing is that the, night, uh, the Nightingales have, have shown quite how agile the NHS can be with the support of the military if we need to be. Uh, but I think have, have given us that extra capacity that we have used but haven't had to use to the extent that we might have feared uh, e even just at the beginning of, of April. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you, Stuart, for submitting your question. Remember that you can submit a question uh, by going on to gov.uk forward slash ask. Uh, and um, I think these questions from the public are, um, are a great addition to our, our daily uh, briefings. And we'll now turn to questions from the media. Um, the first one is from Hugh Pym of the BBC. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, as you said, there's clearly been a rapid and impressive expansion of lab capacity and testing centres and businesses and staff have put in a huge effort and uh, are fully deserving of praise. I, I wanted to ask uh, a little more about where we go from here, hmm. in your view. You touched on it, but a little more uh, detail. How do you intend to further develop and expand the testing network as part of moves to combat the virus? Well, uh, that's a really important question, Hugh. I tried to set out a bit of it, but I, I think there's two parts. The first is that um, we've grown this testing capacity to, uh, to over 100,000, 122,000 tests done um, uh, yesterday. Um, and that's for a purpose, because by testing you can help to treat patients better. We've always been testing patients. You can help get people back to work, and there's been a big expansion of the, of the eligibility to get a test in order to be able to get back to work. Um, and also for surveys, and very soon we should get the first results of the surveys that are out in the field at the moment, so that we know how many people have the, uh, the disease right across the country. And, um, and we should get those results um, very soon. We plan to continue to expand capacity. Um, as I said, there's a, uh, there's a new lab coming on stream uh, next week that AstraZeneca and GSK have put together in Cambridge. Um, and, um, and we'll keep uh, going from there. But the other really important question is making sure we use this capacity in the best way possible. For instance, to have a real focus on care homes to make sure that we can tackle the... Uh, tackle the, the epidemic within care homes as well. John. Yeah, thank you, Secretary of State. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, it is an extraordinary achievement to, to build this capacity so quickly. There is an element of consolidation required now. We need to move to a more sustainable footing. And we also need to try and integrate the work of the new laboratories with the existing infrastructure. So, for example, making sure that the results flow back to general practitioners and so on. So all of that is happening. And that will, that will really help us to use this new capacity to its maximum benefit. Um, and then, as Secretary of State said, there are a whole range of other opportunities to support um, the NHS, the care sector, and also other sectors such as uh, criminal justice by making testing available. And I think the really exciting development is this uh, rollout of testing at home, which, of course, would be very, very helpful for any contact tracing, a really flexible, fast way of getting tests to people when we're using our contact tracing, track and trace um, uh, app and so on. So we, we're very pleased with what we've done so far, but it really is only a start, uh, and we do need to apply what we have now to the, uh, to the uh, challenges of the future. 
Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, have you got a follow up, Hugh? Is that well, just one more? Yeah. Can you ensure that health and care workers do get priority so yes. they can get tested when they need to be? Yes, absolutely. This is really important. Um, the uh, within the system that we've built, um, if health and care workers um, need a test, um, then they can get one as a priority either through the NHS itself and the NHS's own labs or through the employer route so they can get, essentially go to the front of the queue um, in terms of getting an appointment to one of the drive-through centres uh, or uh, and, and, um, and, that's, and that's an important part of making sure we have the right prioritisation. Uh, you know, we've always talked about the prioritisation starting with patients and then uh, people in the NHS, then wider key workers and then the general public and um, that prioritisation is built into the system. And just to build on this point of testing for contact tracing, the thing is once we have contact tracing in large scale, then you want to be able to test people as soon as possible so that you know if there's a positive test so that then the people they've been in close contact with can, uh, can be advised to act ac uh, accordingly and, and, and isolate so that they don't pass on the, the disease. So that is an, a very important other uh, new part of uh, the priority within testing once we, uh, once we get that up and running by the middle of the month. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, Sam Coates from Sky. Um, Matt Hancock, um, the 122,000 tests is a massive increase in a short period of time. How many of those are home testing kits that were mailed out yesterday but haven't actually been yet uh, returned and analysed by labs? Because earlier in the week, number 10 was indicating that they wouldn't count against the uh, target, but now it does seem as if they do. Um, to John Newton, um, perhaps to this morning we got the news that we've been waiting for, that you cannot get coronavirus a second time. That seems to have come out of a study from the South Korea Central Clinical Committee for Emerging Disease Control. How much weight do you put on that seemingly important study? And Steve Powers, I was interested that you were seeming to be quibble, quibbling with uh, a colleague uh, at Public Health England, um, Dr. Okareki, who was saying yesterday that children don't seem to be able to transmit the disease. Was she wrong? Right, well, uh, what a feast of questions. I will, um, I'll uh, hand over to John to answer the precise uh, numerical questions. Uh, we set out on gov.uk exactly how we count the different types of tests um, for different reasons, because obviously, as, exactly as you said in the question, home tests are, uh, are produced in a different way uh, to the tests at drive-through centres. So John can take us through the exact breakdown of the 122,347 tests um, yesterday. Uh, I just add that in total, uh, we now, over the entire testing programme since the test was invented, have done over a million tests now, uh, 1,023,824. Um, so that's another... Uh, another benchmark that we've managed to reach. John, and then I'll ask Steve to answer the question about the transmissibility of the disease uh, amongst children. Yeah, thank you, Secretary of State. So the um, NHS, Public Health England uh, laboratories, including laboratories in other countries, uh, all four countries of the UK, undertook 39,753 tests between them, of which there were 2,537 in Scotland, 1,090 in Wales, and 1,319 in Northern Ireland and it's worth mentioning we have a partnership with Roche uh, and that partnership uh, they undertook 13,723 tests so the uh, benefit of the public-private partnerships. Um, the tests undertaken by the new Lighthouse Laboratories um, total 79,522. Now of those 39,153 were undertaken in the drive-through centres or in, uh, by mobile units, or in fact um, by uh, research nurses who administered tests uh, as part of the Office of National Statistics Survey. Um, your question, the, uh, the home kits delivered, there were 27,497 um, kits delivered, and there were uh, 12,872 um, uh, tests uh, delivered through the satellite process. Um, and then uh, uh, under uh, the um, surveillance testing, uh, which is a different, which is the antibody testing, there were 3,072 tests undertaken. And so that's the breakdown of the total 122. So your question was about home kits, 27,000, and then there were 12,000 uh, more that were sent out as satellites. 
Thanks very much. Uh, Steve. Uh, um, thanks, Sam. Uh, so, so on the question of transmission in children, um, I'll say what I think the position is. John, with his public health expertise, will correct me if I get any of this, uh, this wrong. I think if a, if a child or a young person is symptomatic, then there's no reason to think that they wouldn't um, transmit the virus in the way that any other person who's symptomatic would be. I think the big question is uh, how many children don't have symptoms but get the virus? Uh, and in that particular case, or in those cases, uh, how transmissible is the virus between them? Uh, and I think that is data that we are still accumulating and evidence that we are still learning about. Uh, and of course, it is one of the key questions when it comes to schools and, and how schools are opened again. Um, so I think the true answer is that the evidence is still emerging uh, over the transmittability of, of uh, virus in children that don't show symptoms. But John, is that your understanding? Yes, absolutely. And should I pick up the question on uh, immunity? Can you get the yes, infection yes, twice? So you good. mentioned that a study. So the science on immunity is still emerging. And I think the general rule is that you would never make a decision based on a single study. So we would very much want to see that result replicated in other studies before we decided to, that that was, that was really the case. Uh, but it's obviously promising. I think it, as people have said before in, this, in these briefings, it would be, it would be uh, very surprising if there was no immunity after an infection. Um, but at the moment, I think the science is still not precise about how much immunity you get and how long it lasts. So, but nevertheless, results such as the one you mentioned are encouraging. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, Victoria MacDonald from Channel 4. Thank you, Secretary of State. Can I just say that um, I'm not quite sure that Sam's question was answered. Uh, there was a report in the HSJ that previously a test would be counted only once the sample had been processed, but that that testing has now changed and that it's being counted once it's been posted out. Is that the case? And then, Secretary of State, I wanted to ask you specifically, the ONS figures today show that you are twice as likely to die from COVID-19 if you live in a de deprived part of the country. What is your reaction to that, and what policy implications does that have for you? Yes, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll ask John to answer the, um, the point from the HSJ, but it's not something I recognise. Um, the um, the the point on uh, the deprivation uh, and, and the point that in more deprived parts of the country uh, there appears to be greater impact, um, this is something that we are uh, worried about and looking at. And we're looking at it in, a, in the context of all of the different, um, the different ways in which this uh, disease seems to have a different impact on different groups. So it, right from the start, we've known that it has a much more serious impact on older people. It appears to have a bigger impact on men. It appears to have a bigger impact on people from uh, black, black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Uh, it appears that people who are obese are more seriously affected by the disease. Um, and there's also this uh, new evidence from the uh, Office for National Statistics of the correlation with uh, with deprivation. So we are looking at all of these things uh, and uh, trying to understand the impact of the virus as much as we possibly can as and when we get new evidence. John. Yeah, so there's been no change to the way uh, tests are counted. Uh, as we've developed new ways of delivering tests, we've taken advice from officials as to how they should be counted. So the tests that are within the control of the program, which is the great majority, are counted when the tests are undertaken in our laboratories. But for any test which goes outside the control of the program, they're counted when they leave the program. So that's the uh, tests that are mailed out to people at home and the tests that go out in the satellite. So that's, that's the way they are counted, have always been counted, and the way we were advised to count them by officials. That's all set out on gov.uk. Um, Sam Lister from The Express. Thank you, Health Secretary. Um, concerns have been raised about how the over 70s have been treated as one blanket group during this crisis, including by um, senior figures in your party. Can you reassure over 70s who are fit and healthy that they will be treated exactly the same as the rest of the population when lockdown measures are eased? And also, it's been made clear today 
that this is not over. But now we are past the peak, people will obviously rightly be hopeful that they can start making plans to see family and friends again, perhaps even have a holiday, um, or you know, meet up together and have a holiday together. Is, is, the, is late summer a realistic time scale for this? Well, Sam, the, la that, the last question is very tempting to, um, to uh, speculate at. But unfortunately, we just don't know. It's still too early to say. And I'm really sorry to have to give that answer. Um, but it is. Um, the five tests we've set out are there partly to try to give everybody um, a sense of when we'll be able to make those next decisions that I know uh, people are yearning for. But we will only lift the lockdown measures when it's safe to do so. This is why test, track, and trace is so important, because it will help us to do that. Uh, it isn't a... Uh, it, it isn't um, necessary to have that in place, but it helps enormously. Um, and it's, it, it, but it is as of today too soon, and hence the message remains uh, to stay at home uh, because that protects the NHS and uh, saves lives. And on your first point about the over over 70s, maybe um, Steve, I can ask you to ask this. But the, there are, you know, there, we were always clear from the start. There's a very specific group who we've been in contact with, uh, who we're asking to shield, which is ensure that they have as little contact as possible with other people for their own health reasons. Um, and after that, the question is a, a, a degree, a gradation of the, of the advice. Steve? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, of course, um, we know, as you know, that, uh, uh, that the over 70s can be absolutely fit and healthy and that, uh, you know, um, that um, it's, it's, it's not the case that everybody over 70 has a chronic health condition or an underlying uh, disease. As the Secretary of State said, we very specifically asked uh, a group of individuals, some of whom are in that age bracket, but not everybody, uh, to shield and to, to do everything they could to stay at home because we, we knew that their underlying conditions put them more at risk uh, of uh, serious complications from COVID-19. So, so that's the group that is being shielded. Of course, everybody is complying with social distancing uh, measures at the moment and being asked to stay at home, uh, whatever age uh, you are. So, so in the generality at the moment, uh, everybody is in that same boat of complying with those measures. I think as we look forward, uh, and as, as I said at the very start, the government moves to a, another uh, combination of measures, uh, including track and trace, uh, that will help us keep the infection under control going forward. Uh, I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to say uh, how would that work in, in sort of age uh, groups and age bands. And, uh, and al although we do know that uh, co complications and unfortunately deaths are more common in the elderly, even without complications, um, I think uh, that's for consideration and that's uh, work I think that we will need to do as we move forward. But, but I think your point is very well made. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, Alan Preston from the Belfast Telegraph. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I just have two quick questions for the Health Secretary. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the impact of coronavirus has not been quite as severe compared to the rest of the UK due to factors like a lower population density. Do you think there's any merit in eventually easing restrictions here at a different pace to other parts of the UK. And my second question, um, as this virus does not respect borders, do you think it would be better for Stormont to work on an all-Ireland basis in fighting the pandemic rather than following the UK lead? Well, uh, thank you. The, um, um, the, the, the thing is that across the UK, the level, you're right, that the level of the virus has been different in different parts of the country. I mean, we saw that in the chart earlier that in, in London, the level's been much higher, in other parts of the country, lower. But what's interesting is that the shape of the, uh, of the curve, um, the rise and then the fall in the virus um, that's just started, um, has been basically the same throughout the country. And so that means that moving... Um, together, I think, was the right approach at the start. Um, and I can see the, the, the case uh, that could be made. And, of course, the decisions that are devolved, we respect the devolution settlement. Um, but ultimately, if you look at the shape of the curve, getting R down and getting the level of new cases right down, um, that's happened um, the UK together. 
Um, of course, the relationship with the Republic is important as well, um, and we have uh, and we have good relations in terms of both at uh, political level, but also at medical level in conversations with the Republic, um, with the decisions that uh, that they take. Uh, but we have very intensive uh, discussions within the UK about the timing of changes uh, uh, within the country. Thanks very much. Uh, Steve Ford from the Nursing Times. Good afternoon. Uh, a Nursing Times survey has indicated almost all nursing staff are feeling more stressed and anxious than usual, and a third described the state of their mental health as bad during the COVID-19 crisis, for reasons, reasons including PPE shortages. So my question is, what are you going to do in the long term to protect the mental health of nurses and other staff on top of the helplines that have already been announced, as we, as we already have a well-documented nurse shortage, and I hope you'd agree that we can't afford to lose any more in the coming months. And secondly, what's your message for black and minority ethnic staff who feel they may have been put at greater risk given the emerging evidence from the mortality data? Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, I think that um, the, the way that nurses across the NHS have risen to this challenge has been admirable. Uh, the bravery and the flexibility uh, that nurses have shown right across the NHS. Um, and um, I, I think that's something that the whole country recognises it, and I recognise it as Health Secretary. Um, I think that um, certainly the measures that we have put in place uh, to help people with uh, the stress and more serious mental ill health as a result of work, uh, are, those measures are important, and I'm very glad that they're in place. I've been trying to get them in place for some time, and we managed to put them in place very quickly uh, as, the, uh, um, as the crisis began. Um, but the other thing, it's undoubtedly true when you talk to uh, nurses on the front line, that increasing the number of nurses so that there are uh, more to do the work that's needed is a really important part of the, uh, part of the plan. And as you know, we committed... Uh, in the election to 50,000 more nurses uh, by the end of the parliament. We remain committed to that. In fact, we've seen more nurses come into the NHS um, over, the, both, you know, over the autumn and then also as a result, direct result of the appeal for nurses who'd left the profession to come back. Um, so we have got more nurses in, back into the NHS uh, and I want to support and cherish every single nurse who works in the NHS because of the important work that they do. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and so I'm sure that'll be a big conversation uh, as, we, uh, as we restore the NHS and thank everybody for the work that they've done during the, uh, during the difficulties of coronavirus. Steve, I don't know if you want to add Yeah, no, I think, I think your point again is a, is a very uh, good point. Um, and of course, it's not just nurses, as you pointed out yourself, it's, it's all staff. Uh, has been a tremendous effort by staff across the NHS. Uh, they have been working incredibly hard, uh, some, sometimes in, in different areas uh, from where they usually work, and of course that, that brings its own stresses. Uh, and I know talking to the chief execs and the medical directors, chief executives and medical directors of, of many of our hospital trusts across the country, that as we begin to now stand up some of the services that we've had to stand down, uh, to manage this surge in coronavirus patients. Uh, those, those leaders locally are thinking very hard about how they support staff uh, because they absolutely recognize that they have gone through a very challenging and at times very stressful uh, number of weeks uh, and that that support is required both in the short term and over a longer period of time uh, to ensure as we move back towards a normal, won't be completely back to normal while we still have COVID, but back towards normal, uh, that staff have the support uh, they need. So I think the comments you've made uh, are very much reflected in the comments I hear from our leaders across the health system. Maybe you could answer Steve's uh, second question as well. Second question, sorry, the second question, just remind me the second question was, Steve? Uh, right, yes. Oh, What's minority. your message for yes. black and minority ethnic staff? And, and John Maybe. might want to answer some of this as well. Um, so, so I think the message for uh, black and minority staff is that we absolutely recognise, as, as Secretary of State said earlier, uh, that uh, this uh, virus is disproportionately affecting, uh, affecting staff. And I absolutely know uh, the concern and the worry uh, amongst, uh, amongst our colleagues in, in, in those groups. And in fact, I've 
I've been talking to them over the last few weeks, as I'm sure Secretary of State and others have. Uh, so, so there are things that we can do in terms of supporting staff and, and helping them uh, through uh, the concerns that they have. Uh, I think there's another piece of work that John will be able to talk about, which is to understand uh, why it is, uh, and again, Secretary of State touched on this a little bit earlier, why it is that the virus seems to be disproportionately affecting uh, members uh, of, uh, of staff and, and the population as a whole from particular uh, ethnic groups. So that work is ongoing in Public Health yeah, England yeah. And, and I think maybe yeah. John will be able to say a little bit because of course that will also inform what we need to do and the approach we need to take going forward. John? Thank you. Yes, so um, as we know then the statistics do show um, increased rates in some people with some ethnic, uh, ethnic backgrounds. Um, the effects are relatively small uh, and they do need to be looked at, uh, though, although very important, um, but we do need to also look at some of the other aspects of the virus. So, for example, the virus uh, is present in different rates in different parts of the country and we know that, um, that, uh, uh, that different parts of the country have very different um, groups of people from different backgrounds. So we need to look at all of these figures together to try and understand what's really going on. Um, and so there is, uh, uh, there is cause for concern, definitely, uh, and we are talking to NHS England about any advice that should be given based on the data, but there is also an important bit of statistical work to be done to try and understand what the, uh, what the real underlying risks are. Uh, and I think it's, it's sometimes um, it, you know, it, it can be wrong to take these statistics at face value. Um, we also know that um, unfortunately, some different uh, ethnic groups have different levels of underlying health conditions. So, for example, people from an Asian background tend, do have more diabetes. And so we're trying to look at uh, to what extent uh, those factors might be at play as well. But, but it is a, it's a very important issue, uh, one that a number of people are looking at, Public Health England, but also a number of university groups are also studying this. Uh, and we're feeding the results back to NHS England so that staff can get the right advice, as you, exactly as you say. But, but I think it's important for us to emphasise that we don't need to wait for that data. That data and analysis is important, but we don't need to wait for that to provide mm. additional support. And in fact, when uh, Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of the NHS, wrote out to, uh, to, uh, to our healthcare organisations, to hospitals this week, we, he made a specific point of ensuring mm. that, that local healthcare leaders do pay a particular attention uh, to supporting and do whatever uh, they feel is necessary locally to support our BAME uh, colleagues. And I, I know from even today talking to some of those local leaders that they are absolutely doing that uh, and uh, providing that support. Thanks very much, Steve. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks very much indeed, everybody. That concludes this uh, daily coronavirus briefing. Thank you.